This is the SF Productions Podcast Network. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. Oh, wait. From the Pop Culture Bunker, I'm Mindy. And I'm Mark. You can check out our audio podcast, How I Got My Wife to Read Comics, on iTunes or on our website, sfpodcastnetwork.com. It was recently announced that Sumner Redstone resigned his chairmanship of CBS. It was about time. He's 92 and reportedly losing his mental faculties. Leslie Moonves will move into that position. He's currently president of CBS. He's kind of old too, isn't he? Well, not nearly as old, but yeah. yeah. Now, this is only the latest in a long, twisted history of changes at what was called the Tiffany Network. <laughs> because it was a diamond or something? Well, because it... There's two theories. One is because they did such high-class shows <laughs> originally. <laughs> okay. And second is that they originally did some of their earliest television broadcasts from a building that Tiffany owned at one point. Okay. I don't know. Okay. So, it all starts in 1927... When talent agent Arthur Judson forms United Independent Broadcasters Radio Network. So, if not for some changes we'll get to in just a second, you could have been watching UIB. <laughs> they almost immediately ran into financial trouble, and the Columbia Phonograph Company saved them. Basically, huge infusion of money. Mm -hmm. And it was renamed the Columbia Phonograph Broadcasting System, with a total of 15 affiliates. Oh, wow, that's like CPBS. CPBS. Ooh. Yeah, could have been that. Only a year later, 1928, Columbia wanted out. So Judson sold the whole network to the owners of Philadelphia's WCAU radio station. Okay. But they didn't want to actually manage it, <laughs> the day-to-day -day stuff. So one of their in-laws, who was the 26-year-old uh, son of a cigar magnate, was put in charge William S. Paley. And that name we all recognize. Yes. Well, you yeah. we should recognize. Yeah. yeah. So he changed the name again to the Columbia Broadcasting System because the mm -hmm. phonograph guys were out of it, but Columbia sounded classy. Yeah. So I <laughs> left that in. Paley was a big fan of radio ads because it doubled the cigar sales. It was like, radio ads work. Mm -hmm. He then bought out the one of the other, other owners and became CBS's majority stock owner. Mm -hmm. But he then immediately needed money. Now, the reason there's all these, these money changes going on, remember, this is at the height of the 1920s bubble right before the Great Depression. Mm -hmm. And just like right before the Great Recession, there were all these shenanigans going on with financials. <laughs> so he needed money. So he sold 49% of the company to Paramount Pictures, mm -hmm. and not the last time we'll hear from them. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, as I mentioned, the stock market soon crashed, making it necessary for CBS to save the company themselves without, you know, infusions, infusions of, cash. of cash. Yeah. So how did Paley save CBS? Well, you have to understand the concept of sustained versus sponsored shows. Sustained meaning no sponsor. Okay. And, and and you just put it on yourself, and you know it, it, you do it, it. What would today be a public affairs show, really? Okay. And he gave these sustained shows to the affiliates for free, while NBC was charging them for the same. Both of them paid the affiliates to run sponsored shows. Okay. <laughs> All right. Many affiliates, because of this, jumped ship from NBC to CBS, mm -hmm. making CBS a much more powerful network. And Paley also had a gift for finding talent. He signed up Jack Menny, Burns and Allen, Kate Smith, and Bing Crosby. Supposedly, Bing Crosby, from he was on a cruise, and he heard Bing Crosby on a, on a record, and then like shipped to shore and say, get this guy a contract, let's go. He concentrated also on daytime programming to sell women-centric products mm -hmm. and basically invented the soap opera. <laughs> and this was all still on the radio. This is all on the radio. Yes. We're nowhere near television yet. Mm -hmm. 1930, CBS broadcast a phone call from a prisoner at the Ohio Reformatory in Columbus during a riot, <laughs> proving the value of live news reporting. CBS very quickly then began their own news division which until then were basically tied to an advertiser or tied to a newspaper. Mm -hmm. 1938. A couple things happened. 
CBS buys the parent of Columbia Records. So they bought him back. <laughs> <laughs> Edward R. Murrow and his boys began early live broadcasts from Europe as the war began. And that was the whole thing with him on the rooftop saying, this is London. Mm -hmm. And then Orson Welles, the same year, panicked the nation with War of the Worlds. In World War II, and I thought this was fascinating, newspaper rationing turned radio into the dominant medium because they literally couldn't get enough room in the papers to put enough ads, and the advertisers wanted somewhere to put them, oh. so they went to radio. And then Congress made advertising a tax benefit during the war. Hmm. So companies with nothing to sell, like car companies and tire companies, who were putting their entire output to the war effort, sponsored radio symphonies and dramas for a tax benefit. I can see that. Yeah. All right. I understand that now. 1946, Paley, bored with managing the company, became chairman and put Frank Stanton in charge. 1947 was the talent raid on NBC. And this kind of set the stage for modern production companies. Paley offered to buy the names of NBC stars in exchange for a lump sum and a salary, allowing them to pay lower corporate taxes instead of personal taxes. Hmm. And so they basically all became LLCs uh -huh. <laughs> and paid themselves a dollar a year and paid personal taxes on the dollar. But as the, as the company, they were making tons of money. And then since CBS owned their names, they couldn't jump ship again. <laughs> Supposedly, some of the stars asked NBC to match the offer, and President General Sarnoff, and he was called General because the U.S. Army gave him a, you know, unofficial title General because of his work in radar and their yeah. and RCA and radar. Uh -huh. He rebuffed them, saying it was un-American to do that. <laughs> so they all sh went over to CBS. Mm -hmm. By the early 50s, TV began to take over from radio, but CBS found themselves with major disadvantages. They bought into mechanical TV in the early 1930s, which never caught on. Yeah, I didn't understand mechanical TV. Yeah. I still don't. <laughs> NBC owned the predominant standard for black and white TV. And CBS planned to leapfrog into color TV, but that was shut down by the FCC in favor of NBC's compatible standard. The idea is all the equipment have to have been thrown away, including everybody's TVs, mm -hmm. if they wanted to go to use CBS's method, yeah. which was supposedly better. Forcing CBS to pay NBC for equipment and patent licensing and influencing them to get into color TV later because it would cost so they, them money. So they got into t color TV later than NBC did. So theoretically, color TV could have come along much sooner than it did. Yes. Oh, huh. CBS also bet heavily on UHF. And for people younger than us, you probably have no idea what I'm talking about. Yeah. There used to be channels... 2 through 13, which were VHF channels, and 14 through 83, which were UHF channels. And there were separate little knobs on your TV right. to change those channels. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Many of their TV affiliates were originally UHF, and it took a while for TV set manufacturers to even put a UHF tuner in, which forced CBS to pay big money for existing VHF stations in order to get into markets. Mm -hmm. 1951. Lucille Ball will only move her successful CBS radio show to TV if her band leader husband is the co-star. He was apparently sleeping around while on tour. CBS had little faith in the show, so they gave them ownership of the show. Oh, CBS. Of course, I Love Lucy became an immediate hit with a 73% share. <laughs> to, to give you a basis, the top shows on television today are lucky to hit 15. Yeah. <laughs> this is... Among other things, invented the multi-camera comedy, brought in a studio audience for a filmed show, created the syndication market, and spawned the Desilu Empire, which created Star Trek, The Untouchables, and Mission Impossible, mm -hmm. among others. Among many others. 1953. Because of the success of I Love Lucy, there was now a syndication market. CBS spun off a new company, CBS Films, to sell shows into syndication. This company would later be called... Viacom, not the last we'll hear of them. 1955, CBS <laughs> becomes the number one network, a title it will keep until 1976. Mm. In the 60s and 70s, CBS, as many companies did then, diversified. Bought, among other things, Fender Guitars, and actually started a musical instruments division, Holt, Reinhardt, and Winston Publishing, which if 
you've seen, if you saw older textbooks, yeah. <laughs> that mm -hmm. was the big company. Yep. Fawcett Publications it made uh, uh, magazines like Woman's Day, the New York Yankees baseball team, and toy companies like Ideal. Mm -hmm. 1971, The Rural Purge. Whenever I hear Rural Purge, I think about Rural, rural Juror. Juror. <laughs> CBS had been number one for over a decade, but new programming boss Fred Silverman researched the numbers, found out that many of the viewers were older and in rural areas, and they don't change buying habits, and they don't spend money, at least at that time. So all rural-based programming was canceled, which meant Beverly Hillbillies, Mayberry RFD, Petticoat Junction, Green Acres, Hee Haw, they're all out. And this was really probably the first demographic cancellations yeah, that absolutely. occurred. Yeah, absolutely. While the decision was questionable, it did free up time slots that went to All in the Family, Mary Tyler Moore Show, Bob Newhart Show, MASH, and Quinn Martin shows like Cannon, Barnaby Jones, and Kojak. That, that, you know, they're the father of the procedural shows there. Right. It also allowed Silverman to spin off shows from those hits like Rhoda, Maude, The Jeffersons, and Good Times. Yes. Which put CBS way in the lead. Silverman later moved to ABC and put them in first place. Yes. Now, we did a whole episode on Fred Silverman. You can check out episode 96. 96, yes. 1982, CBS returned to first place with Dallas. The whole who shot Jr. thing. Mm -hmm. And that led to all these other nighttime soaps. Right. Plus, they got the NCAA tournament away from NBC, which they still have. Mm -hmm. So the whole Final Four March Madness thing. Yes. 1986, CBS drops to third place for the first time, more due to hits elsewhere than actual issues at CBS. Yeah. But it, it, it allowed Lawrence Tisch, with uh, Paley's help, to take over CBS... They sell off Columbia Records to Sony. <laughs> the back and forth, the uh, back and let's forth. Let's get rid of Columbia again. 1993, CBS finally gets into late night with Letterman's show. However, they also lose the NFL, which was on CBS since 1955, to Fox. Mm. At that point, many affiliates moved over from CBS to Fox. And they wouldn't get football back for several years when they ended up stealing it away from NBC. 1995. Westinghouse, after buying out multiple affiliates, ends up buying CBS the corporation for $5.4 billion and later changed their name to the CBS Corporation. Mm -hmm. 1999, Viacom. Remember them? The <laughs> tiny company that, that <laughs> CBS spun, spun off, off to sell to indication? <laughs> Buy CBS for $37 billion. So Westinghouse really did well. They they bought it for five point four. They sold it for thirty seven. <laughs> they had already bought Paramount Pictures. Yes. Remember them? Yeah. In 1994. In the 2000s, they returned to first place with reality shows like Survivor and Big Brother and endless procedurals like CSI Sioux Falls. Sioux Falls. <laughs> 2005. Viacom splits the company into two. The first is CBS Corporation, mm -hmm. which includes CBS, UPN, that later merged with the WB into the CW. Yes. The owned and operated TV stations, mm -hmm. CBS Radio, Paramount's TV production arm, Viacom's billboards, Showtime networks, the cable network, Simon and Schuster, the and, publisher, yeah. and Paramount Parks like Kings Island. Yes. Viacom, the second company, would own Paramount Pictures, the the motion picture arm, MTV Networks, BET. It, the whole thing is owned by National Amusements, the company that was until recently run by Sumner Redstone. <laughs> Which takes us back to the present. <sighs> it's really twisted. <laughs> and I don't know. And now it's back to being a network for old people with uh, Ironically, know, limited demographics. And, and liking it that way, apparently. It's all cyclical. Yes. <laughs> All right, so you can watch CBS or you can check out our audio podcast, How I Got My Wife to Read Comics on iTunes or on our website, sfpodcastnetwork.com. From the Pop Culture Bunker, I'm Mindy. And I'm Mark. Thanks for watching. Bye-bye.